Karen. Looking forward to today's discussion. Uh, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Debbie, for joining us today. Um, so last, uh, this is part of a three-part series, and in the last session focused on corporate legal and general counsel, uh, we talked about a specific application, legal service requests, and how you can streamline that process. In today's session, we're going to step back a little bit and talk more broadly about identifying processes where there's room for improvement, how to streamline and how to optimize before you select a technology solution or some way to address that problem. Now, interestingly, noticing the, the registration list for today, uh, we did find that there are also people working uh, in law firms who join the session, not just corporate legal or general counsel. So we may abstract out some of the observations and insights from today to talk a little bit about how it applies more broadly. Uh, but Mike, I thought that was interesting that, that uh, these problems certainly don't just apply to, to people who are in-house uh, and more broadly. And, and Debbie, I know you're going to bring some perspective to the table about that as well. So with that, Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, start talking about uh, the reality and the experiences you've had working with clients uh, on the GC side uh, and what the promise versus reality looks like in their world. Sure. Thanks, Will. And uh, thanks, Debbie and uh, Karen for the intro. We will abstract a little bit for law firms as well, seeing the, the change in the participant uh, in, in the attendee list. So we'll we'll abstract out a little bit for that. And these comments, you know, they are what we've learned from uh, general trends. They might not be specifically bang on for everybody, but these are things that we've been learning. We'd love to hear your feedback as we go. We're always trying to learn and get better as well. So please don't hesitate to, to give us some feedback. So just to recap what we talked about uh, on the last call, just so that we have a, a baseline. In, in the corporate, in the GCT world, what we typically see, again, not in all cases, but it, some of the trends that we see are when you're being wooed to come into the in-house world, the general counsel world, it's often portrayed as though the environment is a kinder, gentler sort of environment than private practice in that the uh, business provides uh, lots of notice when they need something they're a very reasonable client, you've got good support from management, and you've got lots of people and team members and time and uh, good hours on the GC side in terms of working hours. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, that's not exactly how it pans out. We liken it a bit more to a hairball, and that hairball often uh, is characterized by the business having very high demands, very high volumes, uh, no particular time for waiting for anything. Uh, there's very little notice given to in-house counsel on when things are needed. Often the requests are incomplete or untimely. There is very little uh, understanding for the flow of the traffic and the other priorities the GC has. The in-house counsel are typically sweating with the amount of work that they have. They don't have the appropriate systems, the time, the personnel, and unfortunately management sometimes it's not as supportive as uh, as they could be in terms of considering new headcount, new technology, or uh, new capabilities when it comes to um, bolstering the capabilities of the of in-house counsel. So that's the recap of some of what we presented last time, and we did a bit of a poll last time. Um, Will, perhaps we want to rerun that and see how, how that matched us up against last time, just as a baseline? Sure, you bet. I'm going to push that poll out to the audience right now. And the question broadly is, you know, can you relate to this, whether, whether again, you're in the world of uh, general counsel and, and in-house or a law firm, when it comes to processes within the firm, when it comes to time pressures, when it comes to workloads and managing that, to what extent can you relate to a disconnect between how you like things to be or the vision for how things could be in your day-to-day -day reality? So just push that poll out there to the audience. I'd like to get some input from you. We'll give that just a minute here. Deb, while we're waiting for poll responses, um, how does this reflect what you've seen both on, on the GC and uh, just in terms of companies that come to you with, with process being I mean, it's it's a common challenge, right? We Everyone is trying to get more work done with less time, with less people, with less resources, any other kind of resources, financial resources. And it's it's something that, as we start to work with our clients to talk about streamlining processes and really getting serious about thinking about the way they get their work done, people are really starting to stop and, and take notice that what got us to where we are today isn't going to get us to where we want to be a year from now or five years from now. 
So I think this is really timely. And I think that the way that law firms work with the uh, legal departments of their clients it's something that we should all be super, super focused on is really thinking about not just how can we make our jobs easier at the law firm, but how can we better support the legal department in our within our clients' offices? Okay, great. The poll results show 50% say somewhat true. There are challenges mostly throughout the firm. Another half of the audience said, I can totally relate. This is my world. So apparently there is a disconnect that, that we're seeing and a good reason for this audience to to hear what you guys have to say about how to tackle those problems. So, so next we want to change gears here a little bit, Mike, and I think talk about, and Deb, also from your perspective, talk about how Affinity engages with clients who come to you expressing a pain or a symptom or a process problem. What does that look like? So a lot of times the way that those projects come to us is by us going in and doing a process review and then I love that slide, the graphic on that slide that you had put up before, because process mapping is actually one of my favorite things to do. I just wish my process maps looked like that, because those are awesome. <laughs> yeah, like yeah nobody's, nobody's do. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I like looking at that. I'm like, oh, that would yeah. be really cool if mine looked that perfect. Um, yeah. But going in and just having a third party, having someone from the outside, that's typically how we get brought in. Can you just kind of walk through with us and look at how we're getting our work done? Where The things that we think are taking us longer than it should take us, the things that we think are consuming more resources than we think that it should take. Sometimes we're all just too close to our own challenges and our own problems and our own process issues to really be able to identify the waste or identify the bottlenecks or even just have the difficult conversations with the people who everyone knows is the bottleneck or is the challenge or is the, I'm so rooted in how I've always done things, I'm not willing to do them any other way. So I do, you know, the exercise of defining the current state and really understanding where the challenges are is such an important part of this. And, uh, you know, what, what we find is when people engage with us, they want to tell me what all their problems are and then they want to tell, just to ask me, like, tell us how to fix the problems I just laid out to you. And what I have found is most of the time, the problems that they think they have are actually symptoms of the actual problems that they have. So it's so important to engage in this defining the current state and mapping it out. Even if you don't do it with butcher paper and, and post-its and, and markers and arrows, and even if you don't do it in a, in a full process mapping session, but to really get to the bottom of and understand what the actual issues are and how to solve those, you know, the root cause challenges instead of just solving the symptoms. Are the cases where the client comes to the table with a clear idea of the, the metrics that they want to associate with that and the goals, or is that something you usually have to kind of help them to figure out and define as well? Um, sometimes they do have a clear idea. It's funny, I was talking to someone just at, last week at ILTA about they have a director, I was talking to someone who's a director of innovation at a law firm. And he was talking about how he spends his time going kind of from department to department to talk to people about what they think they need. And his frustration was sometimes, or maybe not sometimes, a lot of times the people in the business aren't really driven by KPIs and metrics, they're just driven by keeping things that are on fire off of their desk. And so even if they do come to him and they think they know what they want, he he's really interested in digging a little bit further into what they actually need and maybe seeing things from a different perspective. So I'd say that sometimes people do come to us with kind of in their minds what they, they know what they want, they want to see or, or where they want to be from a, a measurement perspective. But a lot of times, even when they do come with that, we, you know, shed some light on maybe some other things that they should be looking at or some other numbers that are perhaps more meaningful. And the one other thing that I want to say about that, because I think that is a really important point. A lot of times I see people coming to me with what they want to measure. And we have a conversation about, you know, this is what maybe it's new clients, maybe it's new matters, maybe it's a, you know, a, a deadline management KPI, maybe it's a financial KPI. 
And I always challenge people as we kind of go through talking about what we want to measure after they tell me what they want to measure and we've kind of honed in on exactly what we want to measure. So it's not some big giant thing that there's nothing we can do about. And then I say, what are you going to do if you don't hit that? So if your goal is to open up in a particular department, you need to, you want to be able to open up 40 new matters a month. My question is, okay, that's a great KPI. What are you going to do if you don't? What's the, you know, because if we're just going to report on the KPI so we know what the numbers are, that's not going to move the needle. What moves the needle is when we know what the action is that we're going to take when someone doesn't meet a goal. Okay. So what's the consequence, what's the cost, and what's the fallback plan or the, the alternative action plan if, if, right. if you're not driving towards the number or not? Okay, great. So so both of you would like to, like to go to the next slide. Let's talk about once you've mapped the process, once you've kind of understood where there are pain points and bottlenecks, how do you figure out what to what to prioritize? What's what's the low hanging fruit, or how do you kind of summarize and say, here's what we're going to do next? Um, Mike, I'm happy to speak to that first, and then I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. Um, I mean, I typically go to um, uh, simple on a scale of simple to complex and done infrequently to frequently because the real money maker there is the quadrant two stuff it's the complex but we do it all the time so if it's simple and we do it all the time it's probably easier to automate um, but you don't get as much bang for your buck because it's simple but if it's complex and you do it all the time that's a big money maker and then the other quadrants are simple, but we don't do it very often. I would, that probably be the last box I would focus on. And then there is the complex, but we do it all the time. The, did, I, did I get that right? I meant, did I miss up? I usually I have that screen in front of me looking at it. But I think that the most important thing is if you are really focused on the things that are complex that you do all the time, that is where your real money makers are when it comes to optimization and automation. And Mike, I know you've got some perspective on that too, just in terms of finding things that are yeah, we, and pain. Sure, so definitely fall within the same kind of quadrants that Debbie's talking about. The only caveat I would say is that, that oftentimes complexity, especially now, complexity doesn't necessarily come from the things that we think are hard to do. Complexity comes from simply dealing with volume. And so the complexity of dealing with multiple processes and multiple documents and multiple people and multiple matters, it's not necessarily that any one of them are all that challenging or really truly complex. It's not a wicked problem. It's, it's still a, a kind problem, but the volume makes it a problem. So those are the other things that we look for is it might not be super complicated, but if it's high volume and there are a lot of people involved, then there are lots of opportunities for dropped balls, for miscommunication, for bad handoffs, you know, all those things. So that would be the only caveat that complexity is often driven now by volume. And those are also big, fat opportunities to get rid of waste. Yeah, I, I agree. Agree. So let's talk about how once you've got things mapped out, you've identified what, what challenges you can solve. Now you've maybe come to that agreement with somebody in the law firm or somebody in-house. Talk about uh, getting buy-in. So the next slide we want to address, you know, the one problem that's common among in-house counsel is that they're viewed as a cost center. So there isn't always going to be a budget for investing in process improvement or, or new technology if that's part of the solution. So, Deb, how do you work with clients to make sure that there's a business case for that change? I know you, you one of the things you mentioned was what's the impact if you don't hit this KPI, right? But, but what do you do to help them sell it internally? So I am a big fan of really digging deep into culture and change management before we start to sell anything new and understanding who the players are, what my army is going to look like. And it might be a very small army of people that are really going to be champions for what we're trying to do. I try to do something that is a not, I mean, I don't know that you can say that anything's a guaranteed win, but I really try to start with something that is a guaranteed win that we can almost do an internal case study on where we can talk about, here's what we did, here's what the investment was, and here's what the actual people have said about making that change. 
Um, maybe uh, something very recently that I did is we created a, a, a scorecard for someone after we had gone through and revamped a few of their processes and talked to them about metrics that really mattered. We put together a scorecard and then we walked through with some of their leaders who were kind of the decision makers on spending money and, and doing this from a process perspective. We walked through it and we said, this is what our commitment is to you. It's not just that we want support to change something. It's that we want to be able to report to you on what we have changed. And here's what we're going to do if what we change doesn't have the results that we thought it would have. Here's how we're going to kind of shift that. And I think that's been something really impactful. I think on the corporate side and, and working with legal departments, you're right. It is definitely, as we talk about investments in technology and investments in automation, it is the, the onus really is on us to help put together that ROI and getting people to understand why is this going to make a difference for the legal department and for the, the company in general. And that's been something that as we work with uh, different teams of people and the leaders and sometimes even the naysayers to really help us craft a message that makes sense to the people who are the decision makers and get them to understand what the investment is and how important it is and why it matters. I can't stress enough how the when we see failures on projects like this, it's because people kind of brush off the impact of change. And especially if you're working in a kind of that's the way we've always done it culture, the change management piece, or as I sometimes like to tell our clients, the warm and fuzzy part of this can be the hardest things to get, get the message across about why it's so important to change and to automate and to understand how you get your work done. Okay, great. Thanks, Deb. Um, Mike, on the next slide, there was a quote that you wanted to, to share with the audience here where you said that, you know, if all else fails, meaning whether it's time and resources, aren't available for a deep dive into problem solving, um, there's always another approach you can take. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, sure, there's two reasons I wanted to show this slide. One, because this photo is worse than mine on the front screen, so it absolves me of my of my headshot, number one. Uh, and number two, um, poor Carl Gustav uh, Jacobi here, um, a famous mathematician, but the point that he makes and something that we use generally, as you said, is if you don't have the luxury of going sort of what I would call being proactive, uh, which is doing what you should do in terms of mapping your processes and thinking about uh, this future state that you want and, and coming up with the, the target that you're, that you're looking to change, when all else fails, what we talk about is if you have limited time and limited resources, we say write down your what sucks list. So if you can figure out what sucks in your operation, and you can start to tick things off and eliminate the things that suck, that gets a lot of people's attention. It also gives you the opportunity when you can show people that you're taking pain out of their daily operations. It gets viewed further up the food chain. So that if you are having trouble with budget or you are having trouble convincing management to invest in these sorts of things, knocking off a couple of the items on the what sucks list is definitely something that we feel and see gets attention. And the, and the, and the thing that those types of things that would typically be listed are, you know, we hear from people that they have two to 300 emails a day sitting in their inbox across four or five people in, in their department. There's no single queue. They don't know where it's going. They can't tell if anybody's opened it and they've responded to it. They don't have any centralized way of understanding what the response time is. And as a result, if you don't go any further on the what sucks list, if you can deal with some of that and provide some level of transparency and some level of organization around the incoming queue so that people understand where they are, what's come in, what hasn't come in, when you're going to get responded to, et cetera, that's a huge win. So it's an alternative way of looking at things, and you can also combine the two, the kind of positive and negative view. But if you're really short on time and you need to get people's attention, people are often very quick to say, oh, yeah, I hate when we do this, or this is a terrible situation. So you know, if they're, if they're skeptical about the, the warm and fuzzy side, they're never skeptical about, you know, mm -hmm. well, if you could get rid of that problem, you're going to get my attention. So just sure. a, a, an alternate view of looking at this. And focus on the pain. Okay, so next we're going to throw another poll question out to the audience that, that reflects this piece about getting buy-in uh, and ask you all, what are the biggest impediments that you've got today to changing the status quo? So if, if you're feeling some of the pains that, 
that uh, Mike has listed there, uh, and you've continued to kind of tolerate the way things are, what are the biggest challenges you face? Is it the resources, uh, or is it you simply are so overwhelmed you haven't even had time to think about and prioritize making those changes? Or is some of it what Debbie suggested, which is the, the culture piece of it and, and getting people to, to even commit to making those kind of changes? So we're going to give you just a moment here to respond to that. Interestingly, the early responses that we're seeing from people so far, largely it's culture and capability. That uh, So Deb, to your point, it sounds like that's something that's a real obstacle. It goes beyond just having having budgets and uh, and time to solve the problem itself. It's that, that resistance and doing things the way that I'll do. I'm going to close the poll there, and uh, if I share the results with you, you can see that's exactly what we said. Everyone's saying that's the big problem and that's the big thing. So Mike, I'm going to hide that poll, turn the PowerPoint back over to you. Uh, next, we wanted to talk about kinds of technologies and the kind of platforms that you can use to, once you understand the problems that you've got, how you can actually automate and, and begin to make change. Sure. So thanks for that. Um, yeah, so this, what we're going to take a look at very briefly and just kind of from on a high level standpoint, because we, we are limited to time, we're all, always happy to loop back if people want a, a deep dive on this, but this is a this is a net document specific solution that's available in the same uh, matter centric or project centric uh, view that you would normally have. This is an add on application built by our company Mechanics. It's a workflow engine that sits inside the overview tab of a workspace. So we natively and seamlessly sit inside the net document uh, interface. You can get to all the functionality and the first thing that you'll see. Uh, in this view is when you come to a particular matter or a project, depending on what your terminology is, you will see the status of the activity that's going on for that client in that matter. So how many things are outstanding, how many are incomplete, how many are uh, completed or late. And all of that information is seamlessly brought to you through the application based on standards that you have decided to commit to. So to Debbie's point, if you if you have talked about those things that uh, are the big opportunities to make change in your organization and the things that you're going to focus on, what you can do then is set a standardized approach to how that's going to be dealt with. It can be triggered and used by each practice group or each project group. They can uh, collaborate and deliver service around those standards and then monitor, learn, and improve on an ongoing basis. So that it's not just a one time, oh, we've done this, we've made a change. Because in reality, as soon as you make a change and you unleash it into your organization, it's not going to be perfect. You're going to take a good shot at it. You're going to do the best you can, but you're going to need the capability to make refinements as you go. So our application has been built to be simple uh, and powerful and scalable in the service of creating standards. So non-IT people, non-really uh, technical people can create simple workflows that uh, include practice groups and guidelines as to how things should be executed. You can uh, use and require templates to be completed, precedents, however you want to call them. Uh, and you can have attestation and quality control checklists, uh, and people can be notified and escalated. So there's a bunch of uh, powerful capabilities, but you can start off very simply. Sometimes people just simply start with wanting to know where are we at, what kind of milestone are we at in this process. Not that you're going to be heavy about executing versus a standard or using documents, just simply, you know, we know this is a five-step process. Let's, let's at least understand where we are and how long it's taking us to get through this process. So you can collaborate, you can view where you are, you can see who's responsible for each step. You can set standards if you want. These are optional standards for how long should this step or milestone take us. And then you can create an understanding across the organization on how long this takes, where our problems are, where the bottlenecks are. So there's no guessing anymore about where, where are their problems. But you do get the opportunity to execute and get into a workflow, you have capabilities to uh, message people, to complete steps, to have a full audit trail, and have everything basically at your fingertips when you're not only executing, but when you're learning. So when you get to the reporting capabilities, you can very quickly get an idea of where are we on a particular uh, project or a particular matter, what the status is on that, where the 
who's responsible for the step, where is it stuck, how long has it been sitting there. You can also create reports very easily to help understand, uh, help management understand the volume differences that you're seeing in your work, uh, where it's coming from, what the sources are, what types of requests that you're getting, over what time period, are there trends that you're noticing, like there's an increase in, in a particular type of request from a particular line of business or department, and yet you don't have any headcount increase or whatever the situation may be. Having trend and transparent reports is an important aspect of learning and getting better at how you're delivering your service and working with not only your team, but also management. And lastly, you can also, if you're sending information around or you're collaborating with other people who are not using the system, all the reports are downloadable into Excel spreadsheets, which can then be uh, emailed and, and sent out and, uh, to people who are non-users as a way to have uh, baselines going forward and um, demarcation points along the road saying, you know, this is where we were in October, this is where we were in November, uh, and you have actual details about what's been done, how long it's been sitting there, what documents have been used, etc. So at the end of the day, in concert with the process review and once the process, once the key processes have been picked, and then you start to pick off, you know, cherry pick which ones you think you're going to get the biggest bang for the buck are, then what you can do is really move from the uh, left to the right here in, in while you're decreasing waste and decreasing pain in the organization, that's freeing up resources and time now by eliminating some of those waste points and pain points to allow you to, to decrease some of the risk and move more into uh, increased capacity, increased quality, and getting to that kind of Lean Six Sigma idea of continuously getting better as well as delivery of service. So that's that's what motor workflow enables you to do. But again, it doesn't, it's just technology. It will not make anything better unless you've given it a good uh, review on what processes need to be touched, which what are your big problems, what's the easiest stuff to uh, connect with, and to have that outside party to work through that with you uh, who has a different view than you will and may challenge you on sacrosanct cultural issues that may need to be addressed in order to make real progress. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. So we have, uh, we've come to the, the bottom of the hour here. Any questions that the audience has, this is the time for you to, to post them. We've just got a couple minutes left. Um, the great thing for, for those of you in the audience, if you've already worked with Affinity, you already understand they've got a great understanding of, of your processes. And technologies, and if you're using Net Documents today, everything that Mike showed you is essentially all accessible from within Net Documents, so you can see your processes in the context of the documents you're managing in the system. Uh, one question that came in is, how do you get started, Deb? If, if someone wants to work with you, they've got Net Documents today, but now they want to use it to manage processes as well as as well as documents and, and that sort of stuff. What, how do they how do they engage with you? What does that first step in the process look like? I mean, first step is you can send me an email directly or you can, oh, there's my email address. Look at that, just like magic. Um, send me an email directly and I'm happy to work with you to talk about what, how we might be able to help and who the right people at Affinity are to help. Um, or even just to, for if you want to bounce any questions off of me, I'm happy to do that. So feel free to reach out anytime. Okay, wonderful. Um, we are at the bottom of it, Deb. I know you've got uh, you've got another client to go help after this, so I'm going to turn things back over to Karen. Uh, for those of you who have any additional questions that we didn't have time to address today, again, you can reach out to Deb, reach out to uh, Mike or myself at Mechanics as well, especially if you have questions specific to how to implement or take advantage of motor. Great. Thank you, Will, and thank you, Mike and Debbie. Uh, very, very interesting and looks like some uh, real, pow really powerful tools. So great job. Uh, and thanks to all of you for attending. If you were intrigued by today's session or have any questions, I hope you'll reach out to any of us. I'll share all of our contact information with you on the follow-up email coming soon. And as we mentioned in the past, our mechanics friends will be joining us again in October uh, for another informative webinar. Watch for that registration to be open soon, and I hope you'll join us again. Watch for my follow-up email coming to you shortly with today's PowerPoint and recording, and please do share your feedback with us on the survey that follows. Hope to see you all in October. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Karen. Thank you.